call the meeting to order. And uh, I know everybody has seen the agenda. I will assume it's approved. Um, I've really been looking forward to uh, story hour. I love uh, <laughs> local planning stories. And uh, I know we're going to be uh, hearing a few in a minute. But first, uh, we have the uh, approval of the meeting minutes from uh, April 5th from our Committee of the Whole. And uh, I know those were sent out in advance. So Council members would uh, be so kind as to move approval. Do we have a quorum? Not on the end right now. John has come. He's here. And John is here. Not here but then you know what? We're going to wait on the minutes then. And Deb is here too. Right. What's going to register? John was here. Okay. Right. We're having a quorum as we speak. We're all straight. All right. So You're so kind, both of you. Um, uh, Thanks for having us. Yeah, this is. We've really been looking forward to that. Uh, We've got nine to move to four minutes. All right. All right. <laughs> See how we solve these issues so quickly. We have approval of the minutes. Second. <laughs> Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those minutes are approved. Okay, on to our planning for climate change work. And uh, Eric, are you going to introduce Rachel and Emma, or? I am, yes. Lovely. Well, <laughs> welcome, both of you. And I'm really thrilled uh, we can hear uh, what you're doing, uh, mostly because uh, this is an area you'll find we're very interested in. And we know that it really makes sense from a policy point of view, but it's only gratifying when we hear how it really works out. And uh, so um, we'll certainly have questions. And uh, Eric, take the mic. Uh, thank you, Chair Zoe. I'm Eric Whitecheck, uh, Planning and Climate Policy Analyst with Local Planning Assistance. I'm excited to be here today, and I'm looking forward to getting to know some of the new council members. Uh, we are honored to be here on Earth Week uh, to celebrate all the hard work that makes our region one of the most livable and most resilient in the nation. As some of you know, uh, the first Earth Day was started in 1970, before there was an Environmental Protection Agency, before the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. At that time, there were no legal or regulatory mechanisms in place to protect our environment. Earth Day rose out of a critical need to reduce pollution and sustain our ecosystems for generations to come. Earth Day is a strong example of effective <coughs> advocacy that can inform sound and lasting environmental policy. Minnesota, as a headwater state, has a sacred duty to protect our water resources that flow across our nation. Because of this responsibility, we have some of the most effective water policy in the nation. The Met Council's original inception and mission stem from the need to reduce pollution in our region. However, as you all know, we are faced with new challenges with climate change. Despite these challenges, our region and the Met Council can lead on ensuring that future generations feel safe, healthy, and prosperous here in Minnesota. Our staff work to lead by example on climate action and resilience work by safeguarding and maintaining our own infrastructure and assets we also provide technical resources to local governments to support the work within cities, counties, townships, and tribes. Today, I have representatives from two cities that are performing exemplary work in the areas of sustainability and the building of resilience. We have Rachel working with us on my left. Rachel is an environmental planner from the city of Fridley in District 2. Rachel has been with the city since 2016. Originally from Houston, Texas, Rachel graduated from a dual degree program with a bachelor's degree in biology from Reed College and a master of environmental env management from Duke University. Following graduation, Rachel served as an environmental volunteer with the United States Peace Corps for three years near Chachapoyas, Peru. Is that right? Okay. Uh, Rachel recently completed her seventh winter in Minnesota. <laughs> which, she enjoyed, which she enjoyed much more than the first, which is surprising because this year was bad. Um, in her spare time, she enjoys biking, gardening, and trying new foods with her family. We also have Emma Stress with us. Emma is the city of Bloomington's first sustainability coordinator. Emma 
um, helps Bloomington find ways to meet its current needs without hurting its ability to meet future needs. Most of her work focuses on addressing climate change when she isn't working to solve environmental problems. And that can be found biking, hiking, cheering on the Packers. I'm not so sure about that. Uh, uh, okay, appreciating well. flowers. <laughs> right. Appreciating flowers and baking. Mm -hmm. Emma grew up in Eau Claire and St. Paul and currently lives with her partner in Minneapolis. I will first pass this over to Rachel Workin from the city of Fridley, followed by Emma from Brook Bloomington. Their presentations will be followed by a facilitated panel discussion and then questions <coughs> from the council members. Um, thanks, and I'll hand it over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Eric, and thanks so much for the invitation. Um, members of the council, I'm so happy to be here with you this afternoon. This was a really fun presentation to put together. Um, as Eric mentioned, um, I've been the environmental planner with the city of Fridley for a number of years now, and there's been a lot of change. Um, and I think we're doing really great work and having a good time doing it. Um, my presentation today is on the sustainability work that we're doing um, to address and react to climate change. Um, and part of that, I think, is a how we're implementing that is how my position is funded, um, who I'm accountable to, um, how the work gets done. Um, so Fridley, I think, has a really interesting way of situating the environmental planning position. Um, I report both to our planning manager as well as our public works director. Um, my position is funded in part through a grant specifically focused on recycling work, but also through our stormwater utility fund as well as our, um, our planning budget. So, um, I'm accountable to a lot of people, not only staff, but to our Environmental Quality and Energy Commission and our council, um, and really trying to touch on every aspect of, of the city that, that I'm allowed to. Um, and so I'll go over some of the work that I've been doing um, in partnership with pretty much every other member of our, our staff. It's definitely a team effort. Um, for those of you that aren't as familiar with, uh, with Fridley, we are an inner ring suburb. Um, we share a, a border with Minneapolis um, along 37th Avenue. Uh, like many inner ring suburbs of the Twin Cities, we developed during a very car-centric time, and that's something, uh, a legacy that we're really reckoning with now in our climate work. We have a thriving job force. I believe when we were pulling together numbers for our comp plan, we counted that there are 7,600 more jobs in Fridley than there were members of the working population. And over 30% of our jobs are in the manufacturing sector. Um, I'm sure many of you know that uh, President Biden came to Fridley last week to visit Cummins. Um, that was really exciting for us. We have a really strong park focus in Fridley. Almost all of our residents are within a half mile of a park or within walking distance of a park. Um, we have amazing river access in Fridley. I say amazing, you know, we have river access that's beautiful, but we do need to get more people there. Um, um, not only are we a Mississippi River community, I'd say we're the most important Mississippi River community as both the drinking water intakes for Minneapolis and St. Paul are located in Fridley. So every day, over three quarters of a million people are getting their drinking water from Fridley. So I think we're a big deal. <laughs> and um, if you take away one thing from the About Fridley portion of this presentation is that I think we're a great place to live and work. We did a statistically valid phone survey back in 2021, and 97% of the respondents said that Fridley, that the quality of life was either good or excellent, which I think is you know, a pretty impressive number of people. With regards to our climate change work, um, we are a participant in the Green Step Cities program. Um, we entered the program in 2014 and just received the email two weeks ago that we'll be awarded Step 5 status for the first time this year at the League of Minnesota Cities Conference. So that's really exciting for us. Um, we've been participating in an XL's, XL Energy's Partners in Energy program since um, the end of 2017. Um, so. Um, that's a program that Excel offers to its community partners to develop and implement energy action plan. Um, if you want to get energy work, it's good to have Excel's buy-in. Um, we're a Soul Smart Bronze community. We received that designation um, this earlier this year, so started that process with 
the assistance of the Met Council and with Eric's encouragement. So we're glad to be moving through those steps. We're Tree City USA. Our council has passed a resolution to be a pollinator friendly city. And something that I'm super proud about is that in 2022, we were awarded the Excellence and Sustainability Award by the American Public Works Association at their annual conference in Charlotte. So that was really cool. Um, why do we at Fridley address climate change? Well, our vision is that we believe in a Fridley that is a safe, vibrant, friendly, and stable home for families and businesses. And a huge part of being a stable home is being a place that is safe and livable into the future. That's our main motivation for climate change. We have buy-in on climate change from a lot of different motivation, a lot of different values and levels in Fridley, but we have the most success when we can situate the work with a Fridley-specific focus. There are a lot of people with a, who are a lot smarter than me doing a lot of good work at the global level, the regional level, the national level, the regional level. When I do my work, I try and address it from a Fridley-centric lens. And sometimes you're going to lose people on the climate specific aspects about it. And so it's really important that we always look at what the co-benefits are. Um, in Fridley, we're a downstream community. Uh, everything, all the runoff from Blaine, from Circle Pines, that's coming through us. So it's really easy to talk about the impacts of localized flooding. We, we see that. You know, we, we've been out the past <laughs> week pumping at the Mississippi River with Mississippi River flooding, we can see localized flooding. But when we're talking about the impacts of heat, when we're talking about um, the impacts of extreme weather events, you know, sometimes we need to bring it back down to the local level and talk about the shading of your house, the aesthetics of your neighborhood, the ability for you to comfortably go on a walk with your dog. You know, keep it local, look at the co-benefits. And another motivation at a staff level is it's our responsibility to protect the city's assets. So if we're going to be spending a lot of money on a park improvement project, we need to make sure that those improvements aren't going to be underwater, um, you know, that they're going to be comfortable for people in 2040 and 2060. How do we approach climate change? Um, well, the first thing I do, I would say, you know, the motivation comes from a lot of different places residents, council, our environmental commission, regional plans, but is gathering buy-in from amongst our staff. Um, I can't really do anything myself, <laughs> so I need people to be on board. You know, I know that planting trees is great, but I need our public works department to think that planting trees is great too. And I've just been so impressed with people's ability. We have really high employee retention at Fridley. A lot of people have been working there for 20 years, 25 years. People's willingness to change the way that things have always been done. Um, so I have a picture of our public works department here because I think they've just done a phenomenal job of looking at how operationally they can respond to climate change um, and look at how we're managing our lands um, to be part of the solution. Um, so I want to make sure before I start advancing an initiative that other people are going to support it as well. It needs to be a team effort. Um, you know, with our police department as we're talking about looking at electric vehicles like that, there needs to be a high level of buy-in on that. Um, so once we gather that, that buy-in, then, then we plan. I have to play homage, pay homage to the plans. So um, I, br I break my work out kind of into six different buckets, so those are on the screen as well as the associated plan that's been developed to guide that work. And then we implement those plans as funding allows, and I've tried to list out most of our funding sources in this presentation just to give you a sense of it's a pretty patchwork um, set of funding, um, and the funding really dictates where we focus. What I was doing in 2018 maybe very, is different than what I'm doing now and is probably different than what I'm going to be doing in 2030 because the grants that are available to me to do the work have changed. Um, so going through those six buckets, um, starting off with uh, going through how we're addressing climate change within those six buckets. First is um, how we're addressing development. You know, Fridley has, you know, we're denser than many inner ring suburbs, um, but we still have a relatively low level of density in some areas. So we've really been trying to strategically develop in 
increase density in a way that makes sense for us as a community. Um, we have a transit-oriented development overlay um, so that um, includes land around the North Star train station. That's an area that we're focusing on making more walkable, more accessible to transit. Um, the picture here is from a development that was just completed in 2022. It's three um, building, multifamily buildings. Um, one is, an, um, is a senior, 55 plus building. One is a market rate building and one is an affordable building. Um, so those three buildings work together, they share amenities, um, and they have great access to trails and the train station. And we're also, we've recently approved an ordinance allowing um, accessory dwelling units in Fridley and um, dropping our lot size down to 40 foot lots in some areas of our residential zoning districts. So looking at concentrated density so that people can have an easier time walking, getting to transit, and reducing their um, transportation oriented footprint. Um, we've also been really um, looking at deep <coughs> parking lots. We have a lot of really large underutilized parking lots in Fridley. Um, looking at our manufacturing sector, um, there aren't as many people using the parking lots as there once was. There aren't as many workers who are coming. A lot, so much has been automated. Some of our parking levels, you know, are probably excessive for what's needed today. So we're looking at that, and we're looking at how parking lots in the manufacturing areas and commercial sectors, if they're not being utilized to their full potential, how they could be better utilized. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about coming up is we're looking at expanding our TOD um, to expand to the bus stops uh, that are going to be along the F-Line BRT route. We've had a lot of fun um, planning the BRT with um, with Metro Transit. This staff has just been awesome to work with and really excited to have improved transit in Fridley. You know, we can build transit-oriented development as much as we want, but if people don't have reliable access and quick access to transit, they're going to default back to their car. So we're really excited to bring that other piece to TOD um, and make that a reality with you guys. Um, all right, so the next bucket is our energy work. Um, you know, I think this is probably like the crux of our um, climate change work. Um, we break it out between education, incentivization, and regulation. Um, we, are, we have an energy action plan um, focused on energy efficiency that when we were doing our planning work back in 2018 was, you know, the, the highlight uh, of where we wanted to focus. I don't know if we redid our energy action plan if that would stay the same, but that's what we're working off of. Um, our goal is 20% energy reduction by 2030. We do a lot of citywide communication around energy conservation and renewable energy electric vehicles. We also do a lot of direct outreach. Um, so one of the photos up there is uh, working with um, uh, Minnesota, with the, with the chamber to go out to all of our businesses within our strip malls and letting them know about energy programs that are available to them and getting them signed up. We've also called all of our multifamily properties twice to let them know about the programs that are available to them, which has been really successful in increasing their participation. And we also do targeted events. So there's an annual car show in Fridley. Um, we bring electric vehicles to that car show. So we're doing a lot of education work around energy, how to reduce your energy use, how to access the programs that are available to you, and how to, um, how to make a difference. We also try to incentivize energy efficiency and renewable energy where possible. We have a Fridley um, Housing and Redevelopment Authority that has a Fridley specific interest in maintaining the quality of our housing stock. Um, and they have been buying down Home Energy Squad visits for a number of years. Um, last year, they started a program where they began matching center points um, insulation rebates. Um, to in further incentivize people to not only do the visit, but then to take action on the visit's findings. And once we started offering that program, we saw a huge increase in the number of people who were getting, um, do, completing their installation projects. Um, and of the cities that partner with Center for Energy and Environment to implement the Home Energy Squad program, in 2022, we had the most residents per capita move forward to take action with insulation projects. 
Um, we also um, provide energy efficiency kits. Um, these are provided to us through Excel. They have a wide range of light bulb, um, light LED light bulbs in them. We include information about accessing energy programs. And we hand out those kits. We specifically target um, events where we think under-resourced members of our community are going to be attending. So this is a picture of one of our police officers handing out the kits at our Coats from Cops events. We gave out over 500 of those kits um, last time we, we, had, we were able to participate in this event. We also offer free chart electric vehicle charging at our city hall. So if you guys ever want to come visit, there's a beautiful trail system, great meeting space, and two hours of free electric vehicle charging. Mm -hmm. um, from the regulation side, um, we allow solar by right in the city of Fridley and have increased our outreach to residents and businesses on how to make that a reality for themselves. Um, we're also going through a citywide recodification process, um, recodification project right now where we're looking at all aspects of our city code, which for some people is a really, really exciting <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> um, so through that process, we're looking at increasing electric vehicle charging at multifamily, um, multifamily or requiring that at multifamily properties. We're looking at how to increase um, access to solar. Um, a lot of really exciting changes. Um, and while we don't require any um, energy efficiency above what's um, required in the state building code for all of our discretionary actions, like our special use permits, which I've learned is a Fridleyism, so conditional use permits, um, we do recommend that they participate in Excel's Energy Design Assistance Program or Energy Efficiency Building pro Efficient Buildings Program. So we try and touch on developers, touch developers where we can you know, with regards to energy efficiency, letting them know about PACE financing um, and other opportunities that they have. Um, we also try and practice what we preach. Um, it's helpful for us just to be able to speak about what the programs are and why they're worthwhile. We've started adding electric vehicles to our city fleet. We've switched over a lot of our parks equipment to electric um, equipment. And we participate in the um, Ener Excel's um, energy new construction programs as well. Um, and that was a hard one to get a picture of, but I included one of the art at City Hall because I thought this was really cool. The way we have a new civic campus in Fridley, and the way the funding worked was we weren't able to use it to buy art, but through participating in Excel's Energy Design Assistance Program, we were able to obtain over $80,000 in upfront um, rebates, which we were then able to use to buy some of the art or to buy the art for the campus. So I thought that was a pretty neat um, representation of our participation in energy programs as a city. We've received two um, MPCA Volkswagen grants um, to fund this work. We also received some money through Excel um, as part of the Partners in Energy program, mostly related to outreach. Um, our Fridley HRA provides some funding for energy efficiency and mainly we rely on increasing awareness of other sources. So we're gonna really be ramping that up as more of the IRA funding becomes, um, becomes available. For transportation, our big focus um, in terms of our climate change work is addressing gaps in our trail system so that people are able to safely and comfortably walk or bike or reach transit instead of relying on their vehicles. Um, we also have safe routes to school plans for all of the Fridley public schools that we work with the school district to develop. And one thing that's really exciting is that we've been working with MnDOT and an, another a, part, um, a number of partners, including Metro Transit, on the Pell study. Um, so there's a planning and environmental linkages study for trunk highways 47 and 65 that are just going to dramatically change what those corridors look like in the future. And the impacts on that from transportation, from land use planning, I think are going to be really significant. We fund this. We, we love regional solicitation grants. I believe projects in Fridley have been awarded grant funding in three of the last four cycles, either to the city or um, in partnership with Anoka County. Um, we also apply for a number of MnDOT grants, LRIF, um, and we were recently awarded an active transportation grant from them to put in trail on University Avenue, which will allow people to safely reach some of the new F-line stops. And then we've increasingly been relying on and requiring developers to fund trail and sidewalks and on their properties when during new construction. That's been a big change for us. There's 
Fridley nine, 10 years ago was not doing nearly as much around active transportation as it is now. And it's really exciting and you can see those changes on the ground. Um, in terms of water quality or water, we've been doing a lot with water quality, but since we're talking about climate change, I'm gonna focus more on what we've been doing for localized flooding. Um, the big impetus for our work, um, whenever we do a road project, the engineer, the project manager has to complete a living streets worksheet. So um, when we do a road project, there's a feasibility study that's developed that goes to the council that's necessary to order the project. And now as an appendix to that, um, to that report, they have to complete a worksheet that walks through identifying opportunities for um, water quantity and water quality management. Um, looks at opportunities for improving um, pedestrian and bicyclist use of the roadway. So really thinking about our road projects more holistically in terms of how we're managing water, how are we looking at other modes of transportation? And that's something we're doing now with every street project. Um, and through that, we've identified a lot of opportunities that I think we wouldn't have otherwise. Um, so one of these pictures is a curb cut rain garden that was um, part of a series of six that were installed with the road project in 2022 with a grant from Rice Creek Watershed District. Um, we've also installed a number of sump catch basins We've depaved a number of areas, so it's really specific to each street project, but there's always something being done to address flooding or address water quality through that work that's identified in that worksheet. Um, another thing, another area where we're working on localized flooding is our park system improvement plan. We have a 10-year initiative going on right now in Fridley where we're updating all of our parks. And when we kicked off that, pro that process, we looked at the Met Council's climate vulnerability map um, at which of our parks um, were most likely to be impacted by localized flooding in the future. So where do we need to be paying extra attention to how are we designing the park? Um, how are people going to be able to use the park? And a couple parks really stood out. One of them was, was Craig Park. Um, as you can see, that doesn't look good. There's a lot of blue right over the park. And you can't really tell, but the park is, there's a pinch point in the park, and that is the park's lowest spot. We were already starting to see that when it rained, that low spot was flooding and people weren't able to move from one, from the northern part of the park to the southern part. So it was really negatively impacting, already we were seeing the localized flooding was really negatively impacting how people were using Craig Park. Um, so we worked with Coon Creek Watershed District on a really cool project where we took down a double tennis court to a single tennis court. And where the other side of the tennis court was, we installed um, a large basin. And then there was a complementary basin installed on the other end of the park. And those two were connect are connected by a swale, all vegetated with native plants, and then all of the fill that was excavated from that area was used to build up the open playing field. So instead of having one really flat park that was going to be completely flooded when it rained, now we had low spots for the water, high spots for the active play, and then we're able to put a trail um, on top that connected the playground with the open play space. So it just made the park a lot more usable. The adjacent neighbors really loved it because the flooding was starting to go into their yards as well. Um, and so it ended up being a really cool project and I think will ensure that this park is usable into the future even when we have those really wet years. Um, a lot of funding sources go into our localized flooding work. Um, we get Bowser Clean Water Fund grants. At any given time, we probably have three to four watershed district grants going on. Um, we've received MPCA resiliency grants. Right now we're looking at uh, one of our corridors for that. Um, we received grants from the Met Council for um, our, some of our stormwater features, including at our civic campus, as well as an affordable housing community. We also contribute money through our stormwater utility fund. And I'll just go back just because I forgot to mention this. Um, the road project here, this is another really cool project where we had a four lane, 52 foot wide road on a very not busy section of Fridley and um, through the road project dropped it down to 28 feet and in that space that had previously been roadway installed a series of swales as well as an improved much wider trail. So 
that's, that's the, kind of the type of work that they were aiming for. Um, for natural resources, we have an emerald ash borer mitigation plan. Um, we had a Green Corps intern do a, a tree survey for us, and we estimated that 30% of our canopy is ash. So emerald ash borer is a huge, it, it's going to completely change our urban forestry. Um, so we have a mitigation plan. We're treating a large number of our high quality <coughs> ash trees, removing and replacing our other low quality trees with diverse species. Um, we have an annual tree and native plant sale, and this was our first year we used the growing shade tool um, to identify um, targeted areas. We determined set everyone seven <coughs> or higher based on our budget. Those um, area, people in those, our residents in those neighborhoods will receive even higher levels of discounts on the tree sale. Um, it'll drop a 10 gallon container tree from you know $200 if you went to Home Depot down to $20. So um, that's something we're, we're doing this year. And we've also been doing a number of pollinator plantings in our park. We have, a, have had a large number of conversions to um, prairie plants, which we talk about the aesthetics, we talk about um, supporting our pollinators, but the carbon sink potential of that is really high too. Um, we've received a number of grants for this work. We're applied, we have, a num have received a number of grants from the DNR, um, we've partnered with the NOGA Conservation District on um, neighborhood grants through the Lonsta Legumes Program, in addition to letting our residents know they can apply directly. We've received um, a Bowser Help Grant in partnership with the NOCA Conservation District, and we've received um, a SHIP Grant to create a community orchard. So a lot of cool things going on in that space. Um, and then my last kind of bucket is solid waste management. Um, I know that's not, I'm guessing something that comes up a lot with with the earth, okay, but with Anoka County, just something to keep in mind is that we don't have access to a waste to energy facility. All of our trash is landfilled in Anoka County. Um, and so, especially as those landfills <coughs> close or become full, that trash is going farther away. Um, so there's the carbon um, impact of not only the methane from the landfill itself, but the transport to the landfill that needs to be considered when we're thinking about Berkeley's climate footprint. Um, so we try and address this by reducing what's landfill as much as we can. We do have a curbside organics recycling program that's available to our residents. We do a number of recycling drop-offs, reuse events, and a lot of education. And I guess that's, um, oh, we pay for that with Anoka County grants and our utility fees. And, um, you know, I talked about, I have a slide on it. Success looks like for us, but I'll save that for the forum. And that's my presentation. That's 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 a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. And what we might do is just save questions for after that facilitated panel piece, and we'll pass it over to Emma from Bloomington. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks, Rachel. Do we have the the videos up? We do have the videos. Okay. Video. Whenever you're ready. We got some videos. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Emma Stress. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm from the city of Bloomington. We're about 90,000 people, fourth largest city in Minnesota. Um, I've been in my position for three and a half years as sustainability coordinator. So there's definitely other staff who aren't with me today that are focused on solid waste um, or our urban forestry or our parks. We're lucky to be able to have multiple staff uh, in those positions. I really focused on leading the city towards reaching our climate goals. And that really started back in 2016. That's when um, council decided that the city was going to have a sustainability commission. So that started in 2017. That's also when you start seeing resolutions like in support of the Paris Agreement and saying, okay, let's work towards reaching net zero by 2050. And then in 2018, when Rachel was talking, there's so many similarities. We also participated in the Partners in Energy program with Excel. I was actually working um, at Center for Energy and Environment at the time and wrote Bloomington's plan before I switched over for Bloomington. But um, we put together that plan and really looked at bringing together the community to say, where are we at? And let's bring data to start informing that process. So that plan was passed in 2018, and staff said, 
we need someone who's actually focused on this work because there's a lot here and we're already busy and we need more expertise. So that's when my position was created, Thanksgiving of 2019. I started it on board, four months later COVID happened, so that kind of slowed some efforts, but I think it was really good that it allowed us to have some time to dig into data and start making connections with other initiatives that the city was starting. So my position started three uh, months after my uh, co-worker Faith Jackson, who's our Chief Racial Equity Officer. So we've started to really dig in at the City of Bloomington of what are the connections between racial equity, climate work, and then also we have a staff member now focused on health and all policies. So really looking at the intersections between those three priorities for the city. So. Definitely some of the climate vulnerability tools that Rachel spoke about, those were really helpful when we had citywide trainings on what are the impacts when we bring data from Excel Energy and Center Point Energy, but then start to overlay that with local flooding or where are we seeing our urban heat islands. And then also looking at who's participating in conservation improvement programs with the utilities. So um, we see, which, Let's jump to the, um, a video and then I'll dive into this. So we'll go to the um, second one. You want to pull the second one? Sorry. The second video that is on um, our energy resource it's, workshops. It's not me pulling them up, it's Craig. Oh, no. sorry. He can hear us. He can hear you. 1,500 homes are sold in Bloomington, and each one is required to have a time of sale. That was just the tea. <laughs> <laughs> So this will be about a three minute video speaking about one of the recent initiatives we've done at the city and then I'll explain how that was tied in. But is this the one? This is the one. We're at Cedar Valley Church and we are partnering with the congregation and Good in the Hood to have an energy resource night. We're meeting with residents in the area to give them ideas of ways they can reduce their energy expenses, get help with bills if they need it, or make their homes more efficient. And so it is really important that we can help them navigate maybe sometimes difficult forms to fill out. And so by making it this way, very practical, we are helping a, a segment of the population that otherwise would be left out. Not a lot of people know that these resources are out here for people who need it. And definitely this is a good start to find the resources that you need. It's important to come to these uh, community events and uh, spread the word um, and ways to help. Certainly have a lot of people that utilize the programs, but I think we are underutilized because sometimes people think that the offers are too good to be true, they're just not familiar with them. It can be really confusing to navigate all the systems um, and programs that exist around energy. So the idea was to have all the program providers for the city come to one place. We really try to focus on making it customized to that household's unique circumstances. We try to understand what their household needs, what the unique characteristics are. Are they a renter? Are they a homeowner? What can they control? What can't they control? We're trying to break it down into easy steps that they feel like they can take. I think it's always really important to collaborate. Um, I think when you have more um, organizations in a single space, um, it gives people the opportunity to see that there's resources out there. If I can't help, maybe the next table can help. One side of the table includes those things that can trigger an asthma attack, while the other side has ways to improve your indoor air quality and reduce triggers of asthma in your home. It was great to know how the asthma that I was having, um, she gave me ideas about the vents and stuff, you know, all the dust and mites coming up through the vents and stuff. I'm glad they offer all this because it's, it's really great. In my role as the city sustainability coordinator, my job is to really work towards our climate goals. But the city has many values and also equity and inclusion and health are also important priorities of the city. So what's really special about residential energy is it touches upon many things. So not only is saving energy beneficial for the environment, but it's also saving money at home and it's allowing people to also improve indoor air quality, which has many positive effects. 
we're just really thrilled to be partnering with the city of Bloomington because we really do want to be a help to people uh, in our neighborhood, in our community. So that was a little background about what I'm going to speak about next. So we're going to go back to 2020 when things were a little slow. We couldn't dive into outreach and we started to ask the utilities for data that we hadn't been able to really break down before. And I asked, is it possible to get conservation improvement program participation by census tract so we can start overlaying and see even though we're not able to get tons of demographics, at least we're able to see general trends. And so um, CenterPoint was really great and helpful and gave us all this data, which I know oh, took them a lot of time, but we were able to map it. And what was a huge takeaway for me is looking at a map and seeing two census tracts that tied as our number one users of natural gas per square foot in a house. So it didn't matter what size that home was. Those two census tracts, the difference, one, Median income was around 100,000. The other was around 50,000. And then I wrote it down because I don't have the map, but um, non-English as a primary language. Um, you have our first census tract that is about 40% of residents. Um, then we had 60% uh, in that census tract where our by, it made, made um, let, me, let me run through this again. So census tract A, Median income, 50,000. Non-English as a primary language, 40%. Percent of BIPOC residents, 60%. Um, percent that are renters, um, almost 50%. Now let's compare that with the other census tract. We'll call that B. So we have twice the income at 100,000. We have only 7% of residents that are speaking on English as a primary language. We have 8% um, um, BIPOC community members, and about 20% renters, so much lower um, than we did in the first census tract. Which census tract do you think has higher participation in conservation improvement programs that everyone's paying for when they're using natural gas in the city? Do we think it's the first one, A, or B? B. It's B. Okay. So with water heater rebates, we saw over the course of 2015 mm -hmm. to 2020, we saw a double participation in the census tract that had higher income, more residents that spoke English as a primary language, less BIPOC residents, less renters. We saw the same trend for insulation rebates. We saw double the participation. And for furnace, um, we saw 19% of the eligible um, households participating in furnace rebates, whereas we only saw 8%. Um, so again, pretty much over half uh, less. So this is a big trend for us to, especially looking at climate work. If we were just looking at energy efficiency, I could say, hey, it doesn't matter which, which census tract or where we're focusing in the city. But if we're thinking about our other priorities of housing affordability, if we're thinking about health, if we're looking at climate vulnerability, where are urban heat islands? It's in the census tract where we see on the eastern side of the city, where we have more impervious surfaces, we have less parks, and those are where residents are, we see a higher chance of residents struggling to pay bills, which is also data that we ask, you know, who's behind on bill payments. So from the equity, the health, and the climate perspective, it really made us think about, okay, we've been doing kind of the traditional outreach of here are the flyers working, you know, which are which are great things. Going to the farmer's market, talking about Home Energy Squad and, and these programs that are helping some residents, but clearly what exists is not working for everyone. And who is it most important from a climate and vulnerability perspective to make sure resources are there, who's going to be affected to the highest degree. So that's where we really started looking into having more of a focus of our income qualified programs and then going out in the community to say, okay, what's working, what isn't. So in 2021, we did some community listening sessions in the census tract where we see, saw that there's the highest um, vulnerability and talked to people in parks and libraries and asked, you know, 
what do you think about home energy? And we did some interactive sessions. We also did that around transportation. And we really learned that it's so hard to apply to the existing programs um, to fill out the energy assistance application. Um, takes so much work, so much documentation. There's a lot of confusion around it. Um, and that these pathways that we as the city, or myself, was like, oh, you fill out this application, it had this nice like streamlined process, and it's, it's not like that. So we've really took time with the city to kind of go back, <coughs> focus on a lot of community engagement around where people are at, and then start, we're starting to build up and have more conversations, and then out of those conversations, um, develop programs. So the video that we saw was, um, one example of using a small search C grant, um, which was really extra support to be able to partner with the local congregation and food bank where residents were already doing weekly shopping, and then get all the program providers to come in, pay for translations so that we had in-person translators that could work through um, the applications to be able to get people into the assistance programs that then could provide weatherization assistance and do those upgrades that uh, were more difficult for some residents to complete that weren't able to financially pay for that on them by themselves. So that's one thing that we've started. And then also city council, which is amazing, approved a position to work with me. So next month we'll be doubling our team of staff and that position will really be focused on community outreach and how we can connect residents to existing programs, but also provide feedback on how we can improve um, utility programs and then also with federal funding coming, think about the support that the city can provide to fill in those gaps. So that's one thing that um, we've been working on. I think a takeaway, uh, some of the prompting questions were, how do you do this work? Partnership is key because we don't want to overlap and do work that another organization is already doing, right? That's not efficient. Um, but also recognizing we, as the city, have relationships sometimes that um, larger organizations don't. Um, so being able to kind of see what are our strengths, where are our gaps and weaknesses, and how can we start putting the puzzle pieces together to better serve our residents and businesses. So next, I'm going to talk about a policy um, a project that we recently worked on, where starting a year ago, every home in Bloomington is now required to have time of sale energy disclosure. So since 1995, we had truth and sale of housing where we really looked at it from a safety perspective um, an inspection before that house went on the market. And we thought, okay, looking at data again, I, I like data, um, being able to see, okay, at this rate of people participating either in the state um, weatherization program or home energy squad program through Excel and Center Point, we aren't gonna make our goals that we have for the reductions we need. And we know residential energy is a fourth of our overall um, emissions um, from, from um, energy, which is a large, large part for us. So we were thinking, okay, what do we need to do to increase this? And we thought, hey, we already have a program where we have inspectors going to homes and doing inspections. They're already around a water heater. They're already looking at some of these things that we would be looking for for energy efficiency. Can we leverage this existing program to provide more information, reach more households, to give them a sense of how their home is performing, to then be able to connect them to resources? So that was kind of the, the background for the time of sale energy disclosure program. So I'll stop and show a quick video of that and then talk about some of the benefits and barriers of making that program happen. Every year, over 1,500 homes are sold in Bloomington, and each one is required to have a time of sale housing evaluation. The time of sale evaluation produces a report that provides valuable information to potential buyers regarding the physical condition and necessary repairs of the home. Starting on April 1st, a new energy disclosure component will be added to the evaluation to provide property buyers with information about a home's energy assets, bringing visibility and value to home energy improvements. 
During the evaluation, inspectors will record information including the home's attic type, insulation type, and how many inches of insulation are present, the age and venting type of the heating system, the number of windows without storm windows, the water heater's age, venting type, and fuel type, the type and age of air conditioning equipment, if present, and for homes built prior to 1980, inspectors will drill a single two-inch hole in a discrete location in the original part of the house, such as a closet, to record the type and amount of wall insulation. 90% of the homes in Bloomington were built before an energy code was in place. This code required insulation within homes and started in 1980. This means that there's a lot of homes in Bloomington that have inadequate attic or wall insulation, but it's really hard for buyers to tell which homes have that or not. And that's why we want to provide this information through an energy disclosure report. We really help buyers understand what homes have higher energy performance or have these energy features. It will also help them understand the ongoing cost to live in that home because a home that's better performing will have lower energy bills. This also has benefits to the seller because they can recoup investments they've made in energy upgrades when they go to sell that home. To help communicate a home's energy performance, energy information is summarized into an energy disclosure report. This report includes an energy score based upon Bloomington's existing housing stock, recommendations for <coughs> energy efficiency upgrades, and resources to complete those upgrades. The report will be displayed at open houses and available online in an interactive map. After homes are purchased, new homeowners will receive information about their home's energy score, the benefits of energy efficiency, and resources to complete prioritized upgrades. They'll also have access to an energy advisor service to ask questions and get connected to financing, utility rebates, and high quality insulation contractors. The purpose of energy disclosure is to not only increase the awareness of energy efficiency opportunities, but also to help empower residents so that they know how to complete those upgrades. We know that there are many benefits to energy efficiency upgrades, but we also know that it can be intimidating to know where to start. For residents who are interested to complete the upgrades, we want to help them be able to do so. For more information about Bloomington's time of sale housing inspection program and the updates coming April 1st, visit the web address on your screen. So with this program, the initial idea came from our Sustainability Commission. So um, that's often where a lot of these policy ideas come from, from our commission that has 11 members that then make recommendations with their work plan to council. And so we started working on this and what may seem as adding 11 to 12 extra metrics, not a big deal, um, that hole, <laughs> that the two inch hole caused so much anxiety of, are people gonna freak out? Are we gonna have you know problems with hitting a wire? Are we gonna burn down a house? Um, so many fears, and I think that gets back to this work of what is one of the major barriers is with sustainability work, we're always thinking of, okay, what's the new technology? What, we're asking people to do something different, right? And change is hard and it can be scary and there's the unknown. So something that's really important in this work is how can we bring in um, folks who have done it before or experts in the area to be able to alleviate concerns so that we're able to try it out. Thankfully, I mean, it's great to think about worst case scenarios. We have had um, to date zero complaints about having the two inch, you know, whole um, drilled in a, in a closet, but what is really great is now um, we have so much more information and we now are reaching um, about <coughs> 100 to 2,000 more homes a year with information about what we can do to improve that conversion rate. Because with Home Energy Squad, we saw that about within a three year period, um, we have about 13% of folks actually going through and doing the wall insulation, about 33% with the attic insulation, that's a little easier to do. And that's really our number one payback. Um, and that's where a lot of the savings come from. And unfortunately, it's not an exciting thing, right? Everyone wants to see a solar panel or see a flashing car, but um, insulation, uh, isn't something that most of us get excited about, but that's really, because of our age of our housing stock, we know that the majority of our homes need more insulation. And that's something that um, we as a city have thought, 
how can we really get that information in front of people, but also show them how it can get done and then be able to assist with that payment. So that's kind of the next step of how can we work um, with providing additional financing and looking at federal funding coming if there's ways that we can make that um, more feasible for people to actually go through with those upgrades. So um, really excited that that program is up and running and now we're able to do more engagement. And it also shows a partnership because we're able to get support from um, Center Point Energy, who has the same goals as we have to, you know, reduce natural gas use to meet their uh, requirements. So it's really great when we're able to come together and have some of that financial um, uh, resource need covered that we don't have in our own budget. So there's many things outside of those two projects that we're working on. Um, I didn't speak at all about the transportation work. We're, we're working on an active transportation plan and upgrading that, really working on our trail system and connecting to make sure that people are able to get around, looking at multimodal options. Um, we are in the midst of an EV infrastructure plan right now to see what is the role of the city and how do we start mapping out um, where charging needs are and especially um, with a focus on equity and um, our renters and looking at multifamily properties, how do we ensure that um, transportation and electrification is accessible to all folks in the city? So we're, we're looking into those major projects and then also with transportation, which I feel like there could be some collaboration with planning. Uh, it's really helpful to be able to share GIS data or those visuals and those maps, which takes myself or my coworkers a lot of time to put together. But if it already exists, it's great because then we have that visual, we're able to go to council, make the case um, for moving forward for something. So um, especially around transportation, we don't have a lot of the baseline transportation data that we need to dig into the wedge diagram of how much do we really need to get with savings from electrification? How much do we need to get from multimodal options like bike, pet, and transit? And where does that lead us And the, to reach our goal of net zero by 2050? So that's a big planning effort that we're undergoing this year and starting to really map out where we, what's going on now, um, and so that we can start really digging into specific strategies that we had higher level strategies in our energy action plan, but we didn't have any quantitative data to really dig into at that point. So we're gonna be diving into that and then also making some updates the next few years to our energy action plan. So that's kind of a, a living document. So that's a little bit of what's going on in Bloomington. I'd say the big takeaways with this work is Collaboration is needed. As Rachel said, you can't do it alone. Um, looking for those co-benefits. Also not just thinking about climate as a sustainability environmental problem in a silo. Looking at other um, initiatives and values of the city like health, like racial equity, like the economy. And then um, major barriers are having staff time to really dig into something, figure out how to have those conversations, brainstorm, get people on board to try out new things, and then funding to do it. So um, really excited when we're able to be able to share tools for planning, that's super helpful, and then also grant funding to be able to do the work. So thank you so much for having me today, and we'll go into the panel discussion. Can you pass that down? I might sure. actually take it off. So I'm conscious that many of you probably have questions, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take too much of the time here, but I, I do have a couple questions for, for our two guests. Um, and I might go a little bit off script here if that's okay. Uh, just based off your presentations, you cover a lot of ground. So uh, one thing we heard um, when we were doing a lot of technical resource and outreach during the comprehensive planning cycle, we heard a lot from communities about and I would I would I would be interested to hear your take on this. They were saying that there's enough data out there to do the work. They said there's not a there's not a problem with data so much. But what we did hear from communities is the challenge is staff capacity in cities, local level staff capacity, um, financial resources to do the work, and then the other piece was that community buy-in and elected member buy-in. 
I was wondering if you could speak to that, all of those pieces. Um, you know, in terms of what's what's the biggest challenge doing this work at the local level? How are you able to effectively embed the work so that it can continue over a long period of time? Because I know Rachel, you're talking about stitching together stitching together grants. Obviously, you'd want to see this work continue without having to do that. So I would be interested to know both of your views on how to be how do we embed this work in such a way that it can be sustainable. Um, the, those are all really great questions. So I would say, is there enough data to do the work? I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't say there's enough data to do the work equitably. Um, I think that there's probably enough data to do most of the work somewhat, but the more data you have, the better you're able to implement, the better you're able to actually to track pre and post. You know, the, I think our insulation rebate was a good example where CE was able to say, Center for Human Rights was able to say, this is how many people did it in 2019, this is how many people in 2022. Um, you know, we don't always have that. I think our, our trail programs are an area where it's really hard for us to get good pre and post project data. Um, and I think that could really improve our efforts. Um, I would get time and the staff, staffing and funding are definitely, I would say, there are bigger barriers just for getting projects off the ground. Um, you know, I think one of our hesitations with starting new energy programming is you don't want to promise grant programming to residents in one year, you know, you're not going to have it the next. Um, we've been really lucky to have received Met Council of Water Efficiency grants for the past few cycles. Um, those programs are hugely popular, and I'm not looking forward to the day when they end and someone calls and says, I got a water efficient toilet, and I, we have to tell them we don't have money for them. I mean, that's part of the, the work, but, you know, I think, especially when you're working with the public, you want to be consistent, and if that grant funding isn't always going to be there, it makes it harder to, harder to do so. Um, I would definitely agree that staff capacity and having people to really dig into the work, build relationships, understand how the city works, understand who the partners are on the local level, and just know residents. That's something that takes time. And it's amazing when we have Green Corps members or summer interns, but I feel like they just start getting to really know the landscape and then they're out and then it's the time to onboard again. And, and it's a cycle, so it's really great to be able to have that long-term investment in staff. As far as data, a lot of data exists. I feel like what's missing is that story map or how to make data tell a story that's relatable and can help the community understand um, and then be able to have dialogue from that. We have a lot of spreadsheets behind the scenes, I think, Energy data, we have that. It's kind of connecting it to um, the demographic data to figure out what strategies would be best. Transportation is an area where some more data would be helpful. But at the end of the day, if we have limited time, we know that you know <laughs> if we keep driving gas-fueled vehicles, you know that's a, that's not going to help us reach our goal, right? Big picture, we know what we have to do. So if we spend forty hours to develop a lot of planning tools where it has that map and stuff. Is that worth diving into greenhouse gas emission modeling so much that we're not actually going and working on doing the work? So I think that's where the balance is, where planning is important to be able to have a tool to get people on the same page. But ultimately, I think if we have enough of that direction of this is what we need to do, spending less time to really keep mapping it out and more time to just get her done is, is probably important. So a couple more questions and I'll hand it over to all of you. Um, what's next? What is the next big kind of initiative that you're heading towards or that you're interested in for all communities? Um, well, right now we have our park system improvement pro process. So we're just starting up this year and it's going to be 10 years long where um, we're going to be updating all of our city parks. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Water reuse, energy um, changing. 
the urban ecology of our parks, so that's really exciting. Um, and then we also say that the F line, the BRP coming through Fridley, um, there's, we're planning a lot of trails to support that project um, that are going to be installed over the next few years. Um, and I think then once we update our code um, to expand our transit overlay district around the stops, I think that there's going to just be a lot of exciting stuff. And also with the Pell study, so University Avenue is where where it's going to be. For Bloomington, really excited for the transportation projects that will be happening with the active transportation plan. Um, as far as projects I'm working on, um, we don't have a sustainable building policy for the city. Um, and there are decisions that are made when we have major retrofits or have new construction of how, how efficient are we making this building? Is there going to be solar on it? What are those decision mechanisms? So making sure that we have a process that we are practicing what we preach and having that um, written down and that we're following and tracking it is something that we're going to be diving into. Um, and then long term kind of looking at what that looks like if um, folks are receiving city financial help or something. We're also um, looking into our first solar project. We're behind. Every other city has solar and we don't. So we need to, to catch up, but we're looking at uh, the feasibility of solar in some of our public facilities. So that's something we're diving into. Um, and continuing with our large building benchmarking program that launched last year and really looking at the next steps of when we have we have our properties that are commercial multifamily public that are 75,000 square feet and above sharing their annual um, energy data and so now we can say mm, when we're comparing these buildings these buildings maybe have larger opportunities for saving money and energy efficiency than others and now that we have that information and we're starting to figure out who's who, who are the property managers for all of these addresses, then being able to say, okay, hey, how can we actually be effective in helping complete this work? Because that's the end goal. So um, diving into what property managers and owners really need to be able to figure out the financing or all those barriers to complete those efficiency projects. Okay, and this is a question I've been dying to ask, so I'm gonna save the best for last. I'm sorry if I'm stealing any of your thunder with this one, but um, since 2014, the Met Council has really, you know, we've really ramped up our climate work here. And some of that is operational, um, some of it is tech through technical resources. But I feel like since 2014, the cities have just really accelerated. I mean, they're doing, we have more to learn from the cities than we could possibly like, divulge to you in terms of, you know, you guys are kind of eclipsing us, I think, in a lot of ways as a, you know, as a regional governing body. So um, I have to ask the question of, we're currently doing our regional development guide, our 2050 plan. Um, so in your view, how can regional policy and the Met Council tools and data help you in doing the work that you do? That's what I would really like to know. This is, this is such a good question. I spent so much time thinking about Fridley, um, and so it's important for me to think about people coming into and leaving Fridley and how they're doing it. I think that's a really important part of the piece for us, like we only control what's in our border. Um, so I would say that the transportation side of things is really big, but then also realizing that you know, we are part of the last mile solution, and so what can we be doing to scale up micro mobility? What can we be doing to address some of the last mile issues um, and work together on that? Um, I think would be great. And then just like the, the best practices for, for development surrounding, you know, I think we have a good idea on our local community. Um, but just the opportunities to share successes across the region in, in that realm. I would agree with Rachel that transportation is a huge area that I can see us collaborating in. It, it goes beyond Bloomington's borders, right? So like any city, it's, it's a transportation system. 
I was chatting with a uh, staff in engineering and saying, hey, I'm going to be giving this presentation. Um, do you have any thoughts? I know it seems like some of the funding that's currently set up is only able to be provided for our, our larger roads. And I guess there are a lot of collector smaller uh, streets that would be really great candidates for being able to do bike pen infrastructure and connect to our overall transportation system. So that was one thing that was brainstormed that um, rethinking where financing could go to be able to support some of those projects that maybe aren't on those largest streets. Um, and then as far as planning tools, if I, I mean, I love being able to pull up and, and show the you know local flood map or heat islands and, and have that information. I think keeping that information out there, but being able to kind of tell that story regionally of how this affects people's lives. And I agree with Rachel, people want to know how does this affect me in Bloomington, but being able to show some of those case studies and just make it real for people. like. I was giving a presentation to the League of Women Voters last week and being able to talk about how many people know someone this winter that slipped on ice and those freeze thaw events and how that's going to be happening more and more frequently. And everyone was raising their hand that they know someone that fell. And it's like, that's really going to affect our lives, right? And making that real for people and not just talk about greenhouse gas emissions or what's in the future, but starting to tie in the problems that we're starting to see and then think about what that happens logistically. We're seeing more and more of that and then tying that to energy efficiency, insulation, you know, HVAC systems, all that stuff that isn't as relatable, but wow. say why that matters. All right, I'll turn it over to you and Eric. how you want to do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, Rachel, Emma, and Eric, uh, great panel, great presentations. Uh, we're convinced that uh, staff constraints must be an issue because the two of you have done so much, and it really is the devil's in the details, but it's a lofty vision, and we really, really are interested in it. I know we have a lot of comments and interest. We love being your partners, and uh, that's one of the reasons this comes at such a good time thinking about developing these future regional development guide. Uh, so let's open it up. Who, uh, Peter, I could have started with you because you're oh our guy here uh, <laughs> oh. of our, not our, just our environmental committee, but uh, of our climate action study group. So, uh, uh, yeah, thanks, um, Mr. Chair, and thanks so much for, for coming this afternoon. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with these two fine folks for many years as part of my day job. Um, I'm um, super thrilled to hear that you're using the tools that we already have. Um, the localized flooding tool, the heat map tool. Um, Eric, you're, you must have started applauding internally when uh, <laughs> Rachel was talking about growing shade. <laughs> that tool is being used. And like how you have used that to actually make decisions or change decisions is super exciting. Um, and the water efficiency grants, love that. But that's one of my favorites as well. Um, and I can see why they're very popular uh, with your residents. Um, yeah, my, my initial question was gonna be around sort of what, what you got at, at, at uh, your last question there, which is like, okay, we've got this data, like, what is it that, gosh, like, if you're sitting at your desk and you're like, ah, I just wish there was some map, the GIS, you know, that you referenced, um, or Emma, you referenced how you use data, you love data, um, <coughs> like, golly, is there just one thing that I wish I could do? pull up and see blah. I'm curious to, to kind of explore that mm -hmm. further. And then I'm curious to know, you referenced the federal funding that is like going to be a tsunami hitting us um, with rebates, particularly. Um, do you, and we're all, I feel like we're all sort of 
waiting to learn more about that when the state rolls out their programs and how that's all going to work and how local governments can tie into that and the private sector. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on that. So two parts, data and, and what else <coughs> are we providing beyond the tools that we're already providing? And just kind of your initial thoughts on the Inflation Reduction Act and um, the rebates as it relates to the homeowners, um, to those that are living in apartments, and, and more. How much time do you got? <laughs> <laughs> data goes, uh, I, so maybe this map exists, but yeah. I'm not aware of it. One thing that we're starting to talk through with transportation is really thinking about resident user experience. So not just is there a bus stop here, but really from these point, from point A to point B, how long does it take to get to your doctor appointment? Or how long does it take to go to Civic Plaza to pay a bill or something like that? And so we've started just informally mapping out, okay, by car, it's 11 minutes, by bus, it's, you know, 48, by walking, it's, you know, 90. Uh, more of that information regionally, because I, I think sometimes we miss the point of we're human and we go with what's going to be the most convenient and affordable and a lot of those choices, even if we have great bike infrastructure and we think about safety or we have you know transit if we still have a mode of transportation like a car that's accessible to some people they're going to drive if it's still double the time to take you know another mode like uh, public transportation so thinking about just really that user experience and i feel like time is something from surveys and conversations that comes up often of I would take the bus, but it would take me 45 minutes instead of, you know, 20. So I think that's something when we're thinking about planning and from someone in my position that's really thinking about how do we change behavior so we can meet these climate goals, recognizing electrification isn't going to get us with all the projections where we need to go without looking into um, transit and bike ped as other solutions to this problem time and convenience and those connectors of if I walk to a bus stop or bike to a bus stop, do we have those connections of a bike path that feels safe to go to the orange line? Right now, if I go from public works to the orange line at um, 98th, it does not feel safe. <laughs> uh, to, I don't want to bike on that, I don't bike many places. Um, so then it's like walking a bike to then put the bike on the bus, which you have to put on the outside and there isn't a place to put the bike inside the bus and um, just kind of those user experience. So I don't know how you map that, but yeah. <laughs> mapping something that's a little bit more, not just this infrastructure exists, but the time or the cost or something like that, that we're, I think, more used to making decisions around. Great, yeah, Barbara. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I'll help you with the question you asked. Yes, we have a lot of data, just like we do for other things. Um, we have the travel behavior inventory, which really isn't just transit; it is a survey <coughs> of people and how are you moving around. And so we can tie some of that. I don't know how in detail we can get to Bloomfield. You know, but I think it's worth the conversation because just like at all of our other um, data, we've got a lot. And so um, I think between that and then we also um, have transit onboard surveys. So some of the other things you were talking about, uh, accessibility and the feelings of safety. Um, I would say when you look at our bike barrier study, when you talk about do you feel safe riding your bike somewhere, there's a study that has, uh, you know, if there's a barrier, if there's a big road, if there's a river, if there's something that's keeping you from getting to where you want to go on the bikes, 
network. So yes, we can definitely connect, and I'll give you some resources for that. So um, now, um, but to my question, I actually have a question. This is a Bloomington question, um, but it had to do with energy disclosure. So I come from a guy lived south of the river in Shakopee. So what we have in my area is a much older housing stock. Um, and so, um, like, my neighborhood is probably 1900s to 1930, so, um, so my house is 1924. I don't have an HVAC system, so, or a dishwasher, or some of these things, because I live in an older house. And um, so how, like, would a survey like this, this disclosure, would that negatively impact housing values? Because of, you can, as some rooms get fixed, they, and, and replaced, but usually, They'd be a damaged thing if they're that you would do that to put in new insulation and sheetrock because I still have old plaster behind the plaster is lath and newspaper. Yeah. So you know how how do you handle something like that because it's it, you can't compare apples to apples in those sort of scenarios. Yeah. So what the energy score does that's a great question is it looks at those key me metrics of if you are able to get in the wall how many inches of insulation and then what would get you up to what would be recommended today. So any home that was built before 1980, state energy code didn't allow, didn't require insulation. So you could have newspaper or nothing. So, um, and then if you don't have, for example, air conditioning, that isn't anything that's um, charged against you. If they aren't able to measure something specifically, it takes an average of the community. Again, it's a point of information that gets people thinking about it. Um, obviously, we want to have it as accurate as possible, um, but really it's there to be able to make people see that maybe there are things that they can look into to be more energy efficient. I think you also asked about, does it negatively affect the home value? Um, that's something we looked into during research. Um, I, there are a few other cities that have been doing it for much longer. Um, how it was explained to me is that it's like a pool. If you go to buy a home and it doesn't have a pool, are you like, I'm gonna pay less money because it doesn't have a pool. But if it does, or it has something that's cooler, it would elevate that value, but it wouldn't um, negatively impact. So that's something they're not seeing so far. Um, with any negative effects that people are paying less for a home, but they are seeing that people are paying more if they see that it um, reaches a certain energy efficiency standard. Oh. Interesting. One Should additional question. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. This one's different. So um, the question uh, talking about rental properties where, um, you know, owners themselves maybe, you know, I do have extra insulation in my attic because I have an old house and I did that because we wanted to do that. Um, you know, but how, like, there's with some of these communities and neighborhoods that have a lot of renters, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. your one community had, or part of your community had 50% rentals. How do you work with that to try to incentivize owners who are landlords to do some of the sustainability efforts? The split incentive. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's tricky, honestly. Um, there, that's something that we have not found the solution of what to do. Um, there are programs like Centerpoint offers their rental efficiency program where um, they'll pay for half of an upgrade um, in a one to four unit home that meets income requirements. So there's some programs out there that help lower that burden, but it, it's a barrier, uh, and that's something that I know many cities are looking and utilities are looking into. How do we overcome that? Thanks. Fiber, if I may, too, another um, barrier that, that we've seen in terms of this work is within our manufactured housing communities. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really important housing stock in Fridley. Um, and what we found is while there are programs that exist on paper, we've really struggled to see them implemented due to lack of providers, um, lack and for other barriers, and so that's something we, we don't know how to address, but I just want to highlight as, as an issue. That, that's a great point. I mean, my community, too, we have a couple of manufacturing home uh, communities, and it, it becomes a unique challenge because, um, again, there could be a landlord situation. Um, there's one that, one that where a lot of people own them, and there's another one that is a landlord that owns them all, and the, even the dynamic between those two things very different and make it really tough. Yeah. 
Thank you. Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you mentioned earlier about the Emerald Ash for treatment. Um, some places are giving residents the same deal that the city gets on treating trees on private property. Does Fridley do that? Um, Councilmember um, Wolf, yes. So we contract with um, a company that provides us a bulk discount rate, and then they uh, they offer a reduced rate to our residents, and they would we weren't contracting with them. It's not the same price as we pay, but it is a, a discounted rate. Um, and um, through that I, and being able to promote that, I think we've been able to reach a lot more residents. Something we're still grappling with is just the huge expense of taking down a tree. Um, there's definitely an equity component with that. So really encouraging people to try and treat that tree because it's a lot easier to pay that $100 a year than it is to pay $5,400 at one time in many cases. But the tree removal, that, that cost is something we haven't been able to, you know, fix yet. Anybody? Just tell them. Um, absolutely appreciate all that you shared with us and I know I'm talking to the choir because each of you shared ways in which you're using data and focusing on impacted communities where need is counterindicative to use of programs and so I, I'm really thrilled about the work that you're doing and wondering if you have enough and again this is the data question if you have enough information to be able to spread the framework um, of equity across all of the work that you're doing. You know, is there anything that regionally we could be considering to incentivize that sort of work um, more across the region? You know, as you think about what motivated you to do the work. I'm sure it's all about the values of the communities that you serve. But I know that you have to pick what you can do based upon information that is available. And if I were to ask if you'd be willing to share anything about work you'd like to do that perhaps you're not able to do, but that the region you know might be able to assist not only you to do but others as well you know so as you look at the cons conservation program for example or the tree program um and you're focusing on those most in need where the utilization has been so low could you spread that across other areas or are there limitations and can you share what those limitations are? So, um, one of the things that I know would be really helpful to track for the income qualified programs is we have less information from state um, weatherization programs, so we're not able to track, like for our energy resource events, since we aren't signed up as someone who can track that data, there's data privacy, obviously, but we're at the end of the year, we don't have as consistent information on how many residents have participated in those programs. So it's harder, we have more information on non-income qualified programs than the income qualified programs, which when we have that gap, then I feel like we're maybe missing opportunities or we're not able to advocate as much for to change things around because we don't have the data to necessarily prove it, if that makes sense. Like, we know residents are struggling to get into programs, but we don't. It's harder to say we have X amount of residents who could qualify for these programs, and then we see that folks have, you know, we've had so many participate by the end of the year. So that's, does that make sense? Just being able to track some of those regional programs or state programs would be helpful. Do you have any? Yeah. I appreciate uh, your stretching to think through that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's something that we know that there's 
huge sector. Uh, there's a large number of our residents that we're, we're not reaching. We know that the, the methods that we use to reach people are barriers in themselves. Um, the, you know, the times that we need, the way, the language that we use. And so trying to break that down, it's not just like a climate issue, it's every aspect of, of our, our lo of local government. Um, and so I think Emma's really hitting it on the nail of like, we don't even know yet what we don't know because we don't know who exactly we're not reaching. Um, and once we know who they are, who, who they are, I think we'd be better able to to reach them. I don't I don't even know if that's like a good takeaway from what you were saying, but yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I know that will be a question that I'll continue to ask in different ways in different settings. And thank you. Thank you. Can I add one more thing to that? Another thing that we struggle with is we are not allowed to incentivize people coming to events by providing gift cards to cover a meal or transportation or lived experience expertise. And now there's more flexibility with our city policies around food. But for a lot of the engagement that's needed when we go out in the community to be able to compensate people or make it accessible for people to come, that's something that is a barrier where we usually need grant funding um, to be able to provide that. And then that takes staff time to be able to get those funds. So if there's a way that we can figure out how to um, make it more accessible for more community members to participate in engagement or figure out how city staff, like the new staff position that we're so lucky to have, is gonna really have dedicated time to go out in the community. but. Having one-on-one -on -one conversations takes a lot of time, and I know not all cities have that, so maybe grant funding to be able to support staff or folks to go out in the community and get that feedback and data that is more qualitative than quantitative, but that could be a solution as well. Councilmember Pacheco. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, what, are, what are you doing, or what, where do you see uh, your role with small businesses? In particular, because I, I I'm the president of the Latino Chamber, and we're working with Ramsey County on a recycling program for the restaurants, and there's uh, both in English and Spanish, and, and uh, uh, getting those folks involved and in what uh, and providing this for resources to make it for, for incentives, really. But so, how do you see what you're doing today, and where where, where are you going with small business? Um, council member, that's um, you know the. The business community, I would say for us, is harder to reach than the residential community. We have less access to them. Um, you know, we we have relied on the, the chamber to do our business blitzes and doing that, that direct outreach, just trying to increase, and also letting them know about the WasteWise program, letting them know about the opportunities that exist. Um, as a community, we haven't developed very many programs yet specifically for our business community, and that's an area I think that we need to, to focus on in the future. Um, and um, we do try, you know, where we have the information available to make programs relevant. So, for example, we know who our business communities are large water users, um, and so we send targeted information to them regarding the water efficiency grant. Um, other than that, we rely kind of on our business newsletter just to elevate the information that, that we have available. And then for Bloomington, this is definitely an area of interest that and COVID has made it a little difficult to do some of the outreach that originally we had wanted. Pre-COVID, the city had um, business energy tours where um, both large and small businesses in the city that had completed projects would be host sites and then we would go around and have property managers um, talk to one another kind of with a peer exchange. And that was one way to share the work um, in the business community peer to peer of ways to complete energy projects. 
that after COVID has not started up again, one of the things that I think will really benefit or help the city support smaller businesses is the work that we did to get ready for our large building benchmarking where we went to assessing and now we have contact information and building sorted by square feet so we have a better sense of who our smaller um, businesses are in the city and we have a project which we haven't had staff time but again we're getting more staff to be able to target and do door-to-door -door kind of door knocking during um, some of our business weeks and themes that we have with the chamber throughout the year and with our community development um, department so there have been conversations in the works on how we can improve um, outreach with the existing programs and free audits that are provided, um, but that's something that we, we need to be doing more. Yes. Oh, go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With all the amazing things you're doing, there are also a lot of small communities that don't have the staff that you have. So, is there a little consortium of cities that they can come come help me for a day and help me set things up or you know to to really use what you've learned and done to really reach out again it's staff time it's your time but um you know there's a lot of communities that are as fortunate to have the staff that you have and how could you set up a program or how could we help set up a program to help those communities do what you're doing and at least start on the path. I know for, for me, the Green Step Cities program has been really helpful through the MPCA. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of small communities that participate and ask questions through the listserv and can participate in the workshops. Um, but I think where another great avenue and where I think <coughs> for reaching them is to work with it with, I feel like I'm not always the best mass messenger that sometimes my counterparts and staff who are in professional communities with other with um, staff in other cities and the same title, they do a better job relaying the information. And I just think about, you know, we hosted um, the City and County Facilities Manager Association um, one time, and our facilities manager was able to talk with the other facilities managers about their work. Um, and that was probably more successful than than me doing it. Um, so I think meeting people, you know, where they're at, um, that's a, a potential avenue. And so finding, you know, oh, who who are those associated groups that are already meeting that could benefit from the portions of sustainability that are relevant to them when they don't have the capacity for like a whole person. Councilmember Bento. To piggyback a little bit on what um, Councilmember Cedarberg said, I wonder if we as a council could approach the counties and partner with the counties in doing that kind of outreach. Because I would guess that, let's just use an example, Washington County or Dakota County, they've got folks on their staff who are doing sustainability work. They could help do that. And then we could draw in those smaller communities and townships and kind of partner. Uh, yeah, I just had a, a question, uh, and then some of the terms, uh, almost every term bewilders me because uh, there's a lot of jargon, and so I'm trying to, maybe I need a jargon dictionary to cut through, but first I had a question, how successful have you been engaging students in schools, because often the students are a gateway to the parents and, and organizations connected to the parents, and I know that um, in the past, in other localities, they've engaged the students, and and you know you'd come in, present to the classes, and then have them do an outreach or, or partner with you on projects because you got more legs to walk around and help you do things. I can go first. So in Bloomington, I would say our process has been more informal, but definitely, especially Earth Month the phone is ringing uh, to do presentations. So at least once a year, um, uh, we're presenting to the local high schools or uh, 
elementary school teacher will ask to come have someone give a presentation on recycling or, or something like that. Um, I presented recently to a junior high Lego club um, about renewable energy. They were working on a project. So right now in Bloomington, it's pretty informal, but uh, we get a lot of calls from um, college students who are working on, you know, I have to do an environmental policy class and talk to someone. So um, we get those phone calls, but I agree, kids get things done and they're um, really great messengers um, for information. So I would love to see more collaboration again um, with a one person staff. It's somewhat limited, but um, we definitely are engaging. And I should say, on the Sustainability Commission, I would say where we put a lot of effort is we have two youth commissioners that uh, typically are in high school. So um, there was a lot of mentoring um, of those two students and then um, developing their leadership skills and learning about not only how the city works, but having um, their ideas come to the table and working on projects. And actually, two years ago, when we were doing the listening sessions around um, energy and transportation, I worked with Yang Yang Sing, who was one of our youth commissioners at the time, work on a project before she went off to college to, to do that engagement. So I would say that's maybe one of the more direct ways that I interact with youth in the community. Yeah, I, you know, and it was just, Actually, there were three terms, but I'm only going to um, ask you about two. Maybe everybody else knows this except for me. What's TOD? You got to know that if yeah, you have a council. That's a <laughs> transit oriented development. Yeah. Oh, that's real estate development. Okay, okay. And what's ADOU? And council member, I'm sorry if I, that's on me to be throwing in jargon, you know. No, everybody does it. But... It's just. Uh, See, we're just freshman beanie yeah. council members, <laughs> so we don't know all these terms. No, I thank you for um, you know, for for asking that question and bringing that up. Um, so the the ADs would be the accessory dwelling units. So if you have you know one like a house and a uh, single family zoning, then they can add another like uh, apartment or another dwelling unit on their on their property, even though they're in a single family zoning district. So like an apartment above the garage or something. I, I just want to point out, you passed the, you really listened test. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That, no, but, you know, and, and when you're done with that, you got to get to the colors. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's too advanced. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what information or goals are you looking for in regards to best practices for the TODs? Okay, Councilmember Rose, that's a good question. So we developed our TOD with regards to the North Star Light Rail, um, but now we're looking at bus rapid transit. So we're thinking, can we just expand that to include the BRT stops, or are they functionally different enough that we need to be looking at um, different approaches? Um, one thing that we've seen is, you know, some of our TODs, um, you know, do they, are our parking requirements, are they in line with what other communities are requiring? Um, so just kind of curiosity about what other people are doing and what they're seeing is working with regards to BRTs. I think North Star is such a unique form of transit that I, I think it might be hard to rely on it for all of your day-to-day -day transit needs, whereas BRT, I think cause that could be much more realistic. So we've seen some of our, TO, our, our um, developments around the North Star where people are still relying on a vehicle. Maybe other communities that have already had BRT implemented are seeing more success um, with developments along, those, along the bus route. And so I think there's probably some, some lessons we could learn from them. And I'd just like to kind of lift that up, and I'm going to read Deb Barber's mind right now, which is <laughs> we talk a lot about transit area development along the large transit ways, uh, particularly light rail. But, you know, we have such a knowledge <coughs> about ABRT network that's developing, and there's TOD opportunities within those busways. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, there's some who may say, well, no, they, those might not be permanent. Well, yeah, they are. Those are themselves mm -hmm. important lines, and I really appreciate that perspective. Yeah. 
And Mr. Chair, we are seeing development along ABRTs. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, and it's a lot of redevelopment mm -hmm. typically in some of those areas, so. especially at Cole School. Any other thoughts? All right, well, hey, thank you so much. And like, and Eric, you know, as always, uh, and, you know, like what Peter uh, mentioned, uh, it's great to hear some of our programs, ones that you've been sweating through, like growing a shade, uh, I really like seeing what you use. Um, this is inspiring, and also um, give us some good feedback and thoughts. Uh, to consider as we do our work, but uh, we'll stay close. It's really great to hear your stories. And um, any other uh, business questions for the council? If not, uh, it's time to go home, watch the state of the state, or a twins game, you know, your choice. <laughs> uh, this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>